Live from Times Square in New York City, it's theCUBE, covering IBM's Change the Game, winning with AI, brought to you by IBM. Welcome back to The Big Apple, everybody. I'm Dave Vellante, and you're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. And we're here covering a special presentation of IBM's Change the Game, Winning with AI. IBM's got an analyst event going on here at the Westin today in the theater district. They've got 50, 60 analysts here. Uh, they've got a partner summit going on. And then tonight at uh, Terminal 5 up the West Side Highway, they've got a customer event, event. I mean, a lot of customers there. Uh, we've, we've talked earlier today about the hard news. Seth Dobrin is here, he's the Chief Data Officer of IBM Analytics, and he's joined by Shrisha Rao, who is the Senior Manager of IT Applications at California-based Niagara Bottling. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, well, thanks, Dave, for having us. Yeah, it's always a pleasure, Seth. We, we've known each other for a while now. I think we met in the, in the, in the snowstorm in Boston at the yeah. Spark Summit a couple of years ago. When we were both trapped there. Yeah, and at that time, we spent a lot of time talking about your internal role as the Chief Data Officer, working closely with Inderpal Bandari, and what you guys are doing inside of IBM. I want to talk a little bit more about your, your other half, which is working with clients and the data science elite team, and we'll get into what you're doing with, with Niagara Bottling, but, but, but let's start there in terms of that side of your role. Give us the update. Yeah, like you said, we've spent a lot of time talking about how IBM is implementing the CDO role. Um, while we were doing that internally, I spent quite a bit of time flying around the world talking to our clients um, over the last 18 months since I joined IBM. And, and we found a consistent theme with all the clients in that they needed help learning how to implement data science, AI, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, in their enterprise. There's a fundamental difference between doing these things at a university or as part of a Kaggle competition than, than in an enterprise. Um, and, and so we felt really strongly that it was important for the future of IBM that all of our clients become successful at this because what we don't want to do is we don't want in two years for them to go, oh my God, this whole data science thing was a scam. We haven't made any money from it. Um, and it's not because the data science thing is a scam, it's because the way they're doing it is not conducive to a business. And so we set up this team we call the data science elite team. Um, and what this team does is we sit with clients uh, around a specific use case for 30, 60, 90 days. It's really about three or four sprints, depending on the maturity of the client, how long it takes. Um, and we help them learn through this use case how to use Python, R, Scala in our platform, obviously, because we're here to make money too. Um, to implement these projects in their enterprise. Now, because it's written in completely open source, they can, you know, if they're not happy with what, what the product looks like, they can take their toys and go home afterwards. Um, and so it's on us to prove the value as part of this. Um, but there's a, a, a key point here. My team is not measured on sales. They're measured on adoption of AI in the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so it creates a different behavior for them. So they're really about make the enterprise successful right, not sell the software. Right, compensation drives yeah. behavior. So yeah. at this point, I always ask, well, do you have any examples? So Shrisha, let's turn to you. <laughs> uh, Niagara Bottle. As a matter of fact, so, Dave, we do. And yeah. <laughs> and so you're, you know, you're not a bank with a trillion dollars in, a in assets and under, under management. Um, tell us about Niagara Bottling and your role. Well, uh, Niagara Bottling is the biggest uh, private label bottled water manufacturing company in the U.S. Uh, we make uh, w bottled water for, uh, you know, Costco's, Walmart's uh, major national grocery re retailers. These are our customers whom we service, and uh, as with all large customers, they're demanding, and we uh, provide bottled water at relatively low cost and high quality. Yeah, so I, I used to have a CIO consultancy, and we worked with, with every CIO up and, up and down the East Coast, and I always observed, and it really got you know, into a lot of organizations, I always observed that it was really the heads of application that drove AI because they were the glue between the business and, and IT. And that's really where you sit in the organization. Right? Yes, my role is to support the business in business analytics, mm -hmm. as well as uh, I support some of the distribution technologies and planning technologies at Niagara Bottling. So take us through um, the project, if you will. What, was, what were the drivers, what were the outcomes that you envisioned, and we can kind of go through the, the case study. So the study. current project that we uh, leveraged IBM's help was with the stretch wrapper project. Each pallet that we produce, uh, we, we produce 
obviously cases of uh, bottled water. These are all stacked into pallets and then shrink wrapped or st stretch wrapped with a stretch wrapper. And this project is to be able to save money um, by trying to optimize the amount of stretch wrap that goes around a pallet. We need to be able to maintain the structural stability of the pallet while it's transported from the manufacturing location to our customer's location where it's unwrapped and, and then the cases are used. And over breakfast we were talking, you guys produced 2,833 bottles of water per second. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, a, it's an enormous, <laughs> the manufacturing lines are high speed manufacturing lines and uh, we have a lights out uh, policy where everything runs in an automated fashion with raw materials coming in from one end and the finished goods pallets uh, of water going out. It's called pellets to um, pallets. So, so you pellets of plastic uh, coming out, coming in through the one end and pallets of water going out to the other. And just it's as an aside, are you sitting on top of an aquifer or are you guys using sort of yes, some indeed. other techniques? In fact, we, we do bore wells and, and extract water from, from the aquifer. Okay, so the goal was to minimize the, what, the amount of material that you use but maintain its stability, is that right? Yes. In, during transportation, yes. So if we use too much plastic, we're, we are not optimally, I mean, we're wasting material and uh, it, uh, the cost goes up. We produce almost uh, 16 million pallets of water every single year. So that's a lot of uh, shrink wrap that goes around those. So what we can save in terms of uh, maybe 15, 20% of uh, shrink wrap costs will amount to quite a bit. So. How does machine learning fit into all this? So machine learning is uh, a way to uh, understand what kind of profile, we, if we can measure what is happening on, as, as we wrap the pallets, uh, whether we are wrapping it too tight or um, we're using by stretching it, um, that results in either um, you know, a conservative way of wrapping the pallets or an aggressive way of wrapping the pallets. Uh, I.e. too much material. Too right? much material yeah. is conservative um, and aggressive is too little material and so we can achieve some savings if we were to alternate between the profiles. So too little material means you lose product, right? Yes, it, it, and there's the risk of breakage. So it's a, essentially while the pallet is being wrapped, if you are stretching it too much, there's a, a breakage and then it interrupts production. So we want to try and avoid that. So we want a continuous production at the same time. Uh, we want to be, uh, the pallet to be stable and while saving material costs. Okay, so you're trying to find that ideal balance. And, yes. and uh, how much variability is in, is in there? Is it so, a, a function of, of distance and how many touches it has? Maybe you can share it with that. Yes, so each uh, pallet takes about 16 to 18 wraps of um, you know, the stretch wrapper going around it and that's how much material is laid on about 250 grams of plastic that goes on there. So we're trying to optimize the gram weight, which is the amount of plastic that goes around the, each of the plastic. So okay. it's, about predicting, uh, it's about predicting how much plastic is enough without having breakage and disrupting your, your line. So we, they had labeled data that was, if we stretch it this much, yes. it breaks. If we don't stretch it this much, it doesn't break. But then it was about predicting what's good enough avoiding both of those extremes, right? Yes. And so it's a truly predictive and iterative model that we that we've built with them. And, and you're obviously injecting data in terms of the the trip to the stores as well, right? You're taking that into consideration in the model, right? Yeah, that's mainly to make sure that the pallets are stable during transportation. Right. And that is already determined how much, uh, you know, containment force is required when you stretch and wrap each pallet. So that's not, a, that's a, one of the variables that is measured. Uh, but the input and outputs are, the input is the amount of material that is being used in terms of gram, gram weight. Mm -hmm. We are trying to minimize that. So that's, that's what, what the whole machine learning exercise was. And the data comes from where? Is it observation? So the, have you instrumented? Yeah, the, the instruments, our uh, stretch wrapper machines have uh, an ignition platform, which is a SCADA platform that allows us to measure all these variables. We would be able to get uh, machine variable information from those machines and then be able to um, hopefully one day uh, automate that process of so the feedback loop that says this is this uh, under this profile we've not had any any breaks we can continue or if there's been f uh, frequent breaks on a certain profile uh, or machine setting then we can change that yeah. dynamically as as the 
product is uh, moving through the manufacturing. Yeah, so process. think of it. It's, it's kind of it's kind of a traditional uh, manufacturing production line optimization and prediction problem, right? It's it's minimizing waste, right? While predicting while, while maximizing the output throughput, of yes. uh, and throughput of the production line. And so it's it's a typical you know when you when you optimize a, a production line, the first step is to predict what's going to go wrong. And then the next step would be to pro 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 you know, include decision optimization to say, how do we maximize you know, the, using the constraints that the predictive models give us, how do we maximize the output of the production line? And so this is not a, a, a unique situation. It's a unique material that we haven't really worked with to predict. But they had some really good data on this material, how it behaves. And that's key, as you know, Dave, and probably most of the people watching this know, label data is the hardest part of doing machine learning and, and building those features from that label data. And, and, and they had some, some great data for us to start with. Okay, so you're, you're collecting data at the edge, essentially, yes. and then you're using that to feed the models, which is yes. running, I don't know, where's it run, in your data center? Yeah, in our data or? center, there's an instance of uh, DSX local okay. uh, that we stood up, and uh, most of the data is running through that. We build the models there, and then our goal is to be able to deploy it to the edge where we can complete the uh, the loop in terms of uh, the feedback that happens. And iterate. And, and, and DSX local is data science experience yes. local? Yeah, right? slash Watson Studio. So okay, they're, now, they're now what role did IBM and the data science elite team play? Maybe you could take yeah. us through that. So, um, as we discussed earlier, uh, adopting, adopting data science is not uh, uh, that easy. It requires uh, subject matter expertise, it requires understanding of data science itself, uh, the tools and techniques. And IBM brought that as a part of the data science elite team. They brought both the tools and the expertise so that we could get um, on that journey towards AI. Yeah, okay, and, it, so and it's not a do the work for them, it's a teach the fish. And so my team sat side by side with an agri bottling team and we walked them through the process. And so it's, it's not a consulting engagement in the traditional sense. It's how do we help them learn how to do it? And so it's side by side with with their team, our team sat there and, and walked them through it. For how, how many weeks? We, we've had about two sprints already and we're entering the third sprint. It's uh, been about uh, 30 to 45 days between sprints. And, uh, and you, got, so sprint. you have your own data science team. Yes, um, our, our team is coming up to speed uh, using this project. They're, we've been, they've been trained, and uh, but they needed uh, some help with people who have done this, been there, and have uh, handled some of the challenges of modeling and, and data science. So it accelerates that, that time to, to yeah, value. outcome and value, and then there's a knowledge transfer yes. component that a is, is occurring now. I guess it's, on, it's ongoing, right? Yes, and the engagement is unique in, that sense, in the sense that um, IBM's team came to our uh, factory, understood what that process, the stretch wrap process looks like, so they uh, had an understanding of the physical process and then how it's modeled with the help of the variables and understand the data science modeling piece as well. So that once they know both sides of the equation, they can help put the uh, physical problem and the um, digital equivalent together and then be able to um, correlate why things are happening with the appropriate data that supports those. Yeah, and, and in the constraints of the one use case and the, the, the up to 90 days, there's no charge for this too. So it's, it's like I said, it's paramount that our clients like Niagara know how to do this successfully in the enterprise. Is it freebie? No, it's no charge. <laughs> Free makes it sound too cheap. <laughs> no, okay, but, no, but, it's a, but it's part of obviously in a, a, a you know, broader arrangement with you know, buying hardware and software. Yeah, it, it's, it is, a, it's a strategy for us to help make sure our clients are successful and I wanted to minimize the activation energy to do that so there's no charge and the only requirements from the clients is it's a real use case. They at least match the resources that I put on the ground and they sit with us and do things like this and act as a reference and talk about the team and our offerings and and their experiences. So you've got to have skin in the game, obviously, and you yeah. have you know, an IBM customer, there's got to be some commitment for you know, some kind of business relationship, but how big was the collective team um, for each, if you will? So IBM had about two, two to three data scientists, and, that, uh, okay. yeah, and uh, Niagara matched that, two to three uh, analysts. There were some working with the machines who were familiar with the machines and others w more familiar with the data acquisition and data yeah. modeling. So, so, so each of these are engagements are, you know, they cost us about $250,000 all in. 
Um, so they're quite an investment that we're making in our clients. I mean, two to three weeks over many, many weeks of, of super geeks time. You know, you, so yeah. you're bringing in like hardcore data scientists, math whizzes, stat whiz, data hackers, you know, developer, data viz skills. people. Yeah, the whole, okay. the whole and, stack. And in the level of skills that Niagara has, you got this. So we're, our, we've got uh, actual employees who are responsible for production. Our manufacturing analysts who. Uh, are help aid uh, in troubleshooting problems. If there are breakages, they go analyze why that's happening. Now they have data to tell them um, what to do about it. Uh, and that's the whole journey that we are in, in trying to um, quantify with the help of data and be able to connect our systems with data systems that, uh, and models that help us analyze what happened and why it happened and what to do before it happened. Your team yeah. must love this because they're sort of elevating their skills, they're working with rock star data scientists. I mean, yes. And we've talked about this before, you know, a point that, that was made here is that it's really important in these projects to have people acting as product owners, if you will, mm -hmm. subject matter experts that are on the front line that do this every day, not just for the sub subject matter expertise, because I'm sure there's executives that understand it, but when you're done with the model, bringing it to the floor and talking to their peers about it, there's no better way to drive this cultural change of adopting these things and having one of your peers that you respect talk about it instead of some, some you know, guy or lady sitting up in the ivory tower saying, thou shall. Now, you don't know the outcome yet, right? It's still early days, but yes. you've got a model built that you've yes. got confidence in and then you can iterate that model. But yes. what's your expectation for the outcome? Uh, we're hoping that uh, the preliminary results show help us get up the learning curve of data science and how to leverage data to be able to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So that's our, our idea. There are um, obviously uh, optimal settings that we can use, but it's going to be a trial and error process. And through that, as we collect data, we can understand what settings are optimal and what should we be using in each of the plants. And if the plants decide, hey, um, they have a subjective uh, preference for one profile versus another, with the data that we are uh, capturing, we can measure uh, when they deviated from what, the, what we specified. So we have a lot of learnings coming from the approach that we are taking. You know, you can't uh, control things if you don't measure it first. And well, so you, but your objectives are to transcend this, this, this one project. Yes, and, 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 and do have that across. Impact across. Uh, and then essentially pay for it with a quick return on this business. That's the way to do things these days, right? You get sort of more narrow, small projects that give you a quick hit and then leverage that expertise across the organization to drive more value. Yes. Love it. What a great story, guys. Thanks so much for coming to theCUBE and, and sharing. You. Congratulations. You must be really excited no, about it's, this. No, it's a fun, fun project. All right. Yeah, thanks for having it. us, Dave. Appreciate yeah, it. Pleasure, Thank Seth. You. Always great talking to you and, and keep it right there, everybody. You're watching theCUBE. We're live from New York City here at the Westin Hotel, Cube NYC, hashtag Cube NYC. Check out the ibm.com slash win with AI. Change the game, winning with AI tonight. We're right back after this short break.